17 things that I've learned from the man, the legend, Anthony Bourdain about food. And in these 17 lessons I'm going to be going through, they're roughly categorized in what to eat, when to eat, where to eat, how to eat, and what to choose, what to eat, where you're eating. But before I get into these uh, 17 lessons, if you're unfamiliar with Anthony Bourdain or just want a quick refresher, who is he? Anthony Bourdain, celebrity chef, author, and travel documentarian. He's really the original rock star of the culinary world, and many people would say he was the first culinary bad boy out there. In the 80s and 90s, Anthony Bourdain got his start cooking at restaurants and running kitchens in New York City. And then in 1999, started his fame when he wrote an article to The New Yorker titled, Don't Eat This. Don't eat before reading this. And after that article, he expanded it into a book, Kitchen Confidential, which became a New York Times bestseller. After being an author, then he became this travel show host and personality, uh, starting on the Food Network in 2002, this show called A Cook's Tour, where he would go around as a cook and eat in places like New York and also Tokyo. Um, in 2005, he moved over to the Travel Channel for his show titled No Reservations and then The Layover. And finally, his last show in 2013 on CNN titled Parts Unknown. Uh, that show ran for about six years until 2018 where he tragically passed away. But uh, making this show, he received five Emmy Awards for Outstanding or Informational Series or Special. Um, and so that's just a little bit about Anthony Bourdain. Now let's go ahead and get into the 17 areas, things that I've learned from Anthony Bourdain that have helped form how I eat, where I eat, when I eat, and what I eat. And often when I cite inspirations for Yellow Productions, Anthony Bourdain is pretty high up there on the list. So the first thing I learned from Mr. Bourdain is to eat what is unique in a destination. And this is something he talked about in a YouTube video that he made uh, titled, What You Should Eat in New York City. And, uh, you know, Anthony says, hey, when you come to New York City, there's a lot of different things you could eat in New York City. And arguably, a lot of the food in New York is some of the best in the world, some of the best French food in the world, some of the best German food in the world. But what you should eat in New York City is not French food or German food. What you should eat when you go to New York City is what is particularly unique to New York City. What can you get there that you can't get anywhere else? And of course, in New York City, that's going to be pizza by the slice, famous pizza by the slice, uh, pastrami sandwiches at the many Jewish delis, and of course, the dirty water hot dogs, that's right, the hot dogs from the street carts that they boiled that have been cooking in the water all that time. There's also, related to the dirty water hot dogs, Anthony Bourdain didn't say this, but I think the legendary halal guys, <clears throat> it's the street cart where you can get like gyro meat and chicken, and they got like long lines out of this cart, and they've opened up brick and mortar locations around, but the one in New York City, you can only get it there cooked out of that cart, and it is so delicious. So when you are going someplace, look at what's unique in that destination, and that's what you should get when you're there. And so that's a lot of what we look at when we travel places and when you say, well, Chris, there's this, you know, people often ask me when I go to Vegas why I don't eat more ramen when I'm there. And I'm like, eh, you know, because Vegas isn't known for ramen. Vegas is known for other things, like buffets in particular, right? Vegas has the best buffets in the world. And so when I go to Vegas, I'm going to get those buffets because I can't get those anywhere else. Oh, Phil says, when you're in New York City, don't forget about the bagels. The bagels are definitely excellent in New York City. And Brandon says, even the dirty water hot dog. I think you do have to have a hot dog experience in New York City. The one I like, uh, it's actually less from the streetcar, but it's from this little place called Papaya Dog um, that uh, also serves papaya juice. It's like this really bizarre place, hot dogs and papaya juice, but where else are you gonna get hot dogs and papaya juice other than papaya dog in New York City? Really nowhere else. Phil also points out New York cheesecake. Yes, you should eat New York cheesecake while you're in New York too, because there's places that just sell New York cheesecake by the slice. And uh, 
if you if you watched my videos recently in uh, Whistler, actually there's one I haven't put out yet that you'll see soon, uh, but there's a cheesecake place we always like when we go to Whistler, and it's called Cheesecake Etc. Sorry, not when we go to Whistler, we go to Vancouver. It's called Cheesecake Etc. It is open from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Like, where else can you go to get cheesecake that's only open at those odd, like, vampire area, vampire hours of the night and that also has really good fluffy cheesecakes. Um, Randy says he loved In-N-Out. We're gonna get to that too, but let's move on to number two. The second thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain is to eat like the locals. Anthony Bourdain talked about this one in his book, Kitchen Confidential, that one he released in 2000 that kind of made him famous. Uh, and what he really wrote in this, and I, I actually wanna read uh, like one or two sentences here because he says it better than I can. Anthony writes, do we really want to travel in hermetically sealed Pope mobiles through the rural provinces of France, Mexico, and the Far East, eating only in Hard Rock cafes and McDonald's? Or do we want to eat without fear, tearing into the local stew, the humble taqueria's mystery meat, or the sincerely offered gift of a lightly grilled fish head. Those are Anthony Bourdain's words. So now my words after this is to say, while it may be tempting to eat at a Hard Rock Cafe or a McDonald's or a Subway sandwiches because it's something that you know and it's something that's familiar versus the other thing that's not familiar, it's really cheating yourself of the experience that you will get when you actually eat that local food. Uh, and so this is where I would say, don't do it, just don't do it. The only time to do it um, in my opinion, is when you're like in transit and you're pressed for time. You know, if you're in a train station and you need to get food and you're in France and it's McDonald's or you go hungry, then you know what? It's McDonald's. Don't go hungry just because you're not going to eat some, you know, right, uh, non-local food while you're there, right? Get it to get some sustenance or nutrition. But I also find, um, group tours often go to lackluster food places uh, that try to cater to everybody. One of the reasons why I don't like group tours uh, as big things or even group tours at a destination is just you're eating at really meh kind of restaurants. Um, and then Anthony Bourdain also writes, you want to go to a place uh, where like there's locals only, no photos of the food, the menu is not in English and there are people eating there that look like they go there a lot. Um, and so, yeah, that's always one of those, like, you know, it's not, like, it's not guaranteed to be awful, but when the menu is in 13 languages, it's guaranteed to be a place that the locals don't go to. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, No Filter says, whenever I travel, I always make it a point to eat once at a McDonald's, try the country specific menu. I think that's interesting too, but particularly No Filter, you're saying, hey, what am I getting at McDonald's that's unique to that country? And there are a lot of unique things. Um, Phil says that uh, Anthony was not a fan of iguana tamales. I would probably not be either. And Amber from Vancouver says, hey Chris, if you haven't heard, my favorite uh, Chuen Juda Beijing Duck House in Vancouver just received a Michelin star. I sure did. I feel like I need to like almost remake a video to be like, you know, uh, Vancouver's first Michelin star. I think that's pretty neat. And by the way, this is one where when we go to Vancouver, we eat a lot of um, Asian foods because the Asian food is like the stuff to eat in Vancouver. Um, frankly, it's known as some of the best in North America. And so that's why we have Peking Duck. It's, you know, like one of their few locations for this Beijing Duck House out of China. Um, Brandon gives a frowny face to iguana tamales. I don't blame you, Brandon. All right, the third thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food, where to eat, when to eat, uh, is to look for a long line. If you're walking around a city and you don't know where to eat, look for the places that have a long line. Either a lot of people waiting or at a counter with a lot of people waiting to order. Now, you do kind of have to look with this one and say, um, well, is it just that they're really slow at the cash register or is this actually genuinely a really good place? Um, but uh, <clears throat> Anthony Bourdain's words in this one um, that he told CNN when he was shooting his Parts Unknown show, he says, if the local people are eating it and a lot of them are eating it, we will eat that and we will eat it with gusto. Um, 
Now, this is one where I'll say, you know, the length of the line, I, Chris, personally take that one into moderation. I don't mind waiting 15 minutes for a table or 15 minutes in line to order my food. I have no desire to wait for two hours for a restaurant when I'm on travel because in that case, I'm wasting my time that I could have been exploring Rome, just waiting around for this restaurant. Uh, and so sometimes the ones with the longest waits aren't worth it because they're just the, oh, all the tourists have heard about this one. And so there's a super long wait. So definitely uh, take that into consideration. Um, uh, Javi says, thanks for your uh, CH videos. Learned more when I went there because of your vids. Hey, I appreciate it. Geoman says, Leonard's in Hawaii it was worth the wait. I'm curious, Geoman, how long of a line did you wait at in Leonard's? Because Leonard's in Hawaii, they're famous for their malasadas, their Portuguese style donuts. And I agree, they are delicious. And we, when, like, when we would go there, we'd wait in a line, you know, if it was maybe 10 people deep. But the last time we were in Oahu, when it like, first opened up after COVID, the line was like around the block. It was crazy. And so we weren't quite, quite going to wait there all that long. Uh, Carmen is with me and says, I'm not waiting an hour or two either. Valerian says, wow, two hours. The last thing I waited two hours for um, was dim sum in Hong Kong, but at least it was the kind of place where we got to, we got a number and they called like numbers sequentially. So, you know, our table number is 580 and they're on like 420 and so we're like well we're a hundred tables down we can we can walk around and come back in you know an hour and a half before our table's ready so i'll do that uh geoman says 20 minutes at leonard's which i guess isn't that bad to get some super tasty donuts kathy says we didn't wait that long uh and brandon agrees says two hours i uh could have done something else for my time the fourth thing that I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is Anthony Bourdain talked about where you are most likely to get sick when you're out eating and nobody wants to get sick out eating and that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people don't try new or unique things because they're like I'm afraid I'm gonna get sick but what Anthony said is he said he has found over his many years of experience eating at the most bizarre restaurants including um Oh, I don't know, lots of things that aren't even family friendly, but we just talked about like iguana and those sorts of things. He said, you are far more likely to get ill from the breakfast buffet at a Western style hotel or the tourist friendly restaurant that tries to be everything to everybody than you are from the more local restaurants. And I, I believe this. I mean, particularly the tourist friendly restaurant that tries to be everything to everybody. They are trying to have so many different ingredients that inevitably a bunch of them are going to go bad. And I have personally found the breakfast buffet at Western style hotels. I know I've gotten sick from eating like yogurt that's been out too long or things like that from Western style breakfast buffets in places where, you know, I should have had the local buffet or some local food and not eaten, uh, <coughs> not eaten what I did, but it was easy and it was comfortable when, um, and it's like another traveling thing. And it's now, now Chris is, Chris is thought adding on to this, speaking of like breakfast at hotels, you know, if you're at a hotel that you have the option of the local breakfast or the Western breakfast, I would take the local breakfast. J Japanese hotels do this a lot where you can have the Japanese breakfast or you can have the Western breakfast. The Japanese breakfast is so much better. Um, in Taiwan, in Taipei, you know, the Taiwanese breakfast will be uh, like dumplings and pot stickers and um, watermelon juice and like, I mean, they're different. There's not pancakes and eggs and those sorts of things, but the things they do that are the Taiwanese things are so much better than the kind of mediocre Western things that they do. So I would love to take the delicious local food, even if it's not what I would think of when I think of breakfast, like I'm not used to those things as breakfast, but once I started adjusting my mental model a little bit to be like, this is what I'm gonna have for breakfast, and I'm like, it is delicious. Um, Phil says, uh, wife and I got food poisoning at the Wynn Resort in Vegas. Go figure. That's a bummer, Phil. I'm sorry to hear that. Kathy says the Cheesecake Factory has a large menu. You know, there are places that do try to be everything to everybody. The Cheesecake Factory is one of them. And I think they do a really good job of keeping their things um, fresh and tasty. So I wouldn't like, I don't have a dime on the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, I think they've like really professionalized their kitchen. But there are definitely some places that uh, their um, food 
what uh, cleanliness, uh, their food, uh, you know, how do they track how old it is, isn't so great. Um, right, so speaking of lines, Amber says related to long lines. That's like the line at Egg Slut at the Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas. Not worth the hype. And you know what, Amber? If you think that line is long, you probably haven't been to the original one in Los Angeles. The one in downtown Los Angeles, the line will easily be four times the length that it is at the Cosmopolitan. Um, but I agree with you, it's not worth the hype. There's a, at Resorts World, there's like a breakfast restaurant there that I think makes sandwiches just as good at the ones at Egg Slut, and you can just walk right up and order, and there is no line. Uh, another place people talk about to say lines aren't worth it is Pink's Hot Dogs in Los Angeles. This is another place that people line up for an hour or two to get these hot dogs. Their hot dogs are not worth an hour or two wait. Their hot dogs are barely worth no wait. I mean, I'll eat them given no wait, but I won't eat them given an hour. All right, we're talking a lot. I am thirsty. What's Chris drinking today? Uh, today, Chris is drinking some royal milk tea um, from Japan. This is one of my favorite royal milk tea brands. This is um, Kocha Kaden is uh, the name of this brand. And why do I like this royal milk tea? It's like... Earl Grey tea that perhaps might even have a little bit of like a hint of blueberry or something to it. Quite tasty. When I'm out at the 7-Elevens or Convenies or vending machines, I often look for this particular milk tea. <clears throat> huh. Kathy says, we waited for an hour for croissants in Melbourne. Was it was it worth it, Kathy? Was your hour wait croissant worth it? I'm curious. Geoman says, I've only got food poisoning from the street tacos here in LA. I could see that too. You know, the street stalls, personally, I, I do draw a line there. Like, I do look at places and I say, do they have refrigeration and do they have running water? And if they have no um, good access to either, then I personally give it a hard pass. All right. The fifth thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about uh, eating at restaurants, uh, and this is an interesting one, Anthony Bourdain says dirty bathrooms are okay. Uh, this He was quoted in an article in Time Magazine where Anthony says, I used to say a dirty bathroom was a sign you should not be eating at a restaurant. I've learned the opposite is true. Some of the best food experiences I've ever had are places that they really don't give a beep about that. They know their food is good and that's enough. And this is one where like l reading this, listening to this, thinking about this, um, one of my favorite Mexican restaurants in San Diego where I'm born and raised is called Las Cuatro Milpas. It is uh, underneath the Coronado Bridge and their bathrooms are... Um, to call them bad would be would be nice, really. Uh, like their bathrooms are probably from the 1920s, and maybe that was the last time they were cleaned. I've just really learned to use the bathroom before I go there and afterwards, but not there. But their food is delicious. I mean, I'll go back there uh, like every day. Um, it's like it's that delicious. They're super amazing tortillas, super amazing tacos, and it's one where like I wish they cared more about the bathrooms. And I don't understand why they don't care more about the bathrooms. That's just my particular lens on it. But they care a heck of a lot about the food. Uh, and there will regularly be lines at Las Cotra Milpas of like, you know, like 30 people out the door. Uh, Brian points out Chicano Park. That's right. It's a neighborhood in San Diego known as Chicano Park. There's this park uh, that's underneath the um, Coronado Bridge that celebrates the Chicano Hispanic heritage in San Diego. Um, Geo Man says, I don't know about that tip. You know what? Take it for a grain of salt, but uh, that is uh, Anthony Bourdain's tip for you. All right, let's go on to the sixth thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food. And I think this is one that you should not take with a grain of salt. Like, this one's really important, particularly if you don't want to get sick, uh, is skip the seafood special at non-seafood restaurants. This is one he wrote in his 1999 New Yorker article titled... Uh, don't eat before reading this. And in this article, he wrote, chances are that the Monday night tuna you want has been kicking around in the kitchen since Friday morning under God knows what conditions. Uh, he explains that during the weekend rush, proper refrigeration is almost non-existent as cooks are constantly opening the refrigerator and the restaurant's gotten all their food before the weekend 
to they be there for the weekend. And so on Monday, the thing that the waiter is telling you, hey, this is our special for the night, is the thing that like, that's going bad. That's the thing that they need to get rid of. Obviously, if you're at a seafood restaurant, they know how to really keep their seafood. But if you're at a non-seafood restaurant, one that specializes in steak, chicken, pork, whatever, and then there's there's like odd uh, seafood on the menu that they're pushing for you as the special, you should you should probably skip that one. Uh, Cottage Full of Love says, just trying to get rid of some old stuff. You know, if you were a business, you might even do the same thing. I mean, none of you would, of course, but you know, if you were a restaurant owner, you might. Brandon says, I highly agree with Anthony. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's one of those, uh, Brandon also says seafood from non-seafood restaurants I, I wouldn't even bother with. I mean, I wouldn't either, but I think a lot of these non-seafood restaurants put that on there for the people who, they're not vegetarians, but they don't eat, uh, you know, right, beef or pork, or they don't eat land food, but they'll eat seafood, and so that's on there just for some of those uh, people. Uh, Enfield Rider says, I have a theory of not eating seafood at a restaurant that's far from the ocean. I think that's a great perspective, too. I mean, you know, there are places like Las Vegas that's not close to the ocean either, but you know they're getting it flown in regularly. If you're like, I'm in a place that A, is not close to the ocean, and B, is not close to an airport or fish market that I think they get things regularly, I think that's a good tip too. Um, Jared says, I agree uh, that also don't go to a Mexican restaurant and order anything uh, like American. So yeah, don't go to a Mexican restaurant and order burgers. It's not going to be very good. Um, Amber says it's like sashimi from some podunk place in small towns, nowhere near an ocean. Yeah, I've had really, I shouldn't say I've eaten sashimi or sushi in all that many podunk towns, but I have eaten it in places. Uh, actually, I was recently in um, Orlando for the Disney World trip, and I ate at a sushi restaurant that um, like is considered the best in Orlando, and I had their Otoro, their... Um, like fatty tuna, it really wasn't that great. Wasn't that much to write home about. I mean, it's delicious here in Southern California because we probably get it flown in from Japan and I don't know where it came from in Orlando, um, but it probably took a long trip to get there and so it just didn't taste mm, all that fresh. All right, the seventh thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food uh, and this goes to the last one about like when to you eat, when not to get the seafood special, particularly don't get your seafood special on Mondays. This one is uh, if you're going to eat out at restaurants, particularly in big cities, eat out on Tuesdays. Tuesday is the day you want to go and eat out at a restaurant. Why? Well, because the weekends are super busy and the cooks are burnt out, um, but Tuesdays are your best bet because Anthony Bourdain, Bourdain says, generally speaking, the good stuff. The good supplies come in on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays is when the seafood is fresh, uh, the supply of prepared food is new, and the chef is presumably relaxed after their day off. Most chefs don't work on Mondays. Uh, and chefs prefer to cook for weekday customers rather than the weekenders. Uh, and they often, if you're at like a really kind of creative restaurant, chefs often like to start the new week with their most creative dishes when they're the least busy and they think they have the most appreciative people there. Um, <laughs> Kathy in the chat reminds us all, hey, if you're enjoying this video, please hit the thumbs up button if you like it. I would really appreciate it if you do. Uh, it lets YouTube know that you're enjoying this video and that YouTube should share it with other people because they might enjoy it as well. Um, so please help out the Yellow Productions crew because every like you give of this video goes to give one piece of premium bamboo to those hungry, hungry pandas right behind me. Uh, Phil says, a lot of restaurants around me close on Tuesdays. Interesting. Um, then maybe Wednesday at those restaurants that are closed on Tuesdays. Uh, but yeah, when, uh, you know, when OC Girl and I eat out a lot, and we eat out a lot, and we're like, when do we eat out? And like, in particular, we try not to eat out on Friday or Saturday nights because it's just really busy. And so we like our eat out nights for us. It's maybe Thursday night or Sunday night. Um, or like lunchtime on Saturday and Sunday, just places when they're less busy. We don't have to wait as long too. The eighth thing <clears throat> that I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is to not order well done meat unless you want to eat garbage. Uh, Anthony Bourdain's quote here is, Anthony says, 
people who order their meat well done perform a valuable service for those of us in the business who are cost conscious. He's speaking as him, he's in the business, he's in the restaurant business. So people who order their meat well done perform a valuable service for those in the restaurant business who are cost conscious. They pay for the privilege of eating our garbage. In many kitchens, there's a time-honored practice called save for well done. The Philistine who orders his food well done is not likely to notice the difference between food and flotsam. Yeah, and I, <laughs> there's, I, I remember I was out with one um, colleague and he was ordering a steak and when they asked him how he liked it cooked, he was like, well done, like kill it, like, like really make that done. Oh, and he, oh, they killed it for sure. He was like, this thing looks like a piece of charcoal. I mean, obviously he wanted well done, but he probably didn't want it, you know, like that. Um, how do I like my steak? You know, at good restaurants, like where I know the meat is good or this and that, I like medium rare, but I find if I order a medium rare all the time, sometimes for me, I get it and it's just a little bit too raw. And so I tend to order it medium just because I know it's less bloody and things like that. Um, but I really like, you know, steak restaurants where like the plate is hot, like so hot that you can almost like cook the meat on the plate. I really, really like the practice in Japan where at a lot of um, like the high end Kobe beef restaurants, they will bring uh, either a hot, like a super hot iron skillet to your table or they'll bring a superheated rock, literally a rock to your table. And then you put the cubed Kobe beef on it yourself to cook. Um, and then that way you can basically decide how long you want to cook it. It's not a big honking steak, so it doesn't need to be cooked in a oven for, you know, or a cast iron skillet for a long time. Like it can be cooked on a rock or that because they cut it pretty thin. Um, Brandon says, I have a thing against uh, having pink in my meats. And I've found, uh, Brandon, I, hey, I understand it. Whatever floats your boat. If you don't like pink, it's all good. Um, I think if the meat is good, pink is not a big deal. Uh, but yes, there's clearly plenty of people that agree with Brandon. Um, but Amber says, I don't even want to describe a properly cooked steak as well done. I don't want people thinking I ordered it well done. I say perfectly done or something else. That's interesting, Amber. Um, and Danielle says, I don't want to see any moo on my plate when I order steak. Yeah, I mean, you don't want your steak to like get up and walk away or something like that. Phil says, I'm a medium guy, pink in the center. Um, and uh, Randy says, well done is a sin. Uh, but Jared says, he orders well done because that's what he grew up eating and it's hard to get used to the texture of anything like medium or medium rare. I can see that too. Obviously, well done is the easiest way to cook a steak because you don't have to take it off early, just cook it as long as you want to. And then you're like, all right, that's right, that's been there for an hour, it's done. All right, the ninth thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is to not be afraid to eat a bad meal. Uh, Bourdain told Fast Company magazine to be open to experience, be willing to try new things, don't have a rigid plan, accept random acts of hospitality without judgment or fear, don't be afraid to wander, don't be afraid to eat a bad meal. If you don't risk the bad meal, you never get the magical one. I think that last one I'm gonna read again. If you don't risk the bad meal, you never get the magical one. And so yes, on the quest to find magical meals, you're gonna have an occasional bad meal, but I think that risk is worth it. Uh, it can't all be perfect, but if you're always at McDonald's, you know they're never gonna be magical. I guess maybe unless you're eating all your meals at Disneyland, because Disneyland is magical. There's magic in the food right there. Uh, I also think this note about, you know, accept random acts of hospitality without judgment or fear. It's one, um, you know, a story about one of the best meals I've ever had in Italy was at this restaurant in Rome that was like a basement level restaurant. And for whatever reason, you know, like the, the waiter who worked there was taking our order, we were chatting with him, and then the owner came by and told the waiter like to, you know, scram because the owner was going to take our order. And the owner was basically like, um, hey, I heard you, you know, saying you like mozzarella and you like pasta. And uh, how about I just, how about I just bring you, how about I just bring you some of the things I like? How's that sound? We're like, 
Hey, that sounds awesome. And let me tell you, it was one of the best Italian meals I've ever had. And you know, there's a little bit of like relinquishing control to be like, you know what, why don't you just bring me that? How much is it gonna cost? <laughs> I'm not really sure. What's it gonna be? I don't know. Um, but we had this like amazingly fresh buffalo mozzarella cheese, amazing um, truffle pastas, amazing desserts. And I think if we were looking at the menu, we wouldn't have ordered the same things that he brought out for us. Um, one of the questions I like to ask in restaurants, if I don't know what to order, or even if I look at things and maybe I do, is I like to ask uh, the staff, you know, whether it be the server or whether it be the person behind the counter, I like to say, hey, what do you like here? What's your favorite thing to eat here? I don't ask them um, what's the most popular thing here or what do they recommend because ostensibly they recommend the things that like they get the highest profit from or they recommend the things that they think most people like. Um, but you know, like if they work there, particularly if it's like an ethnic restaurant, uh, then I wanna know what they like because chances are what they like it's gonna be what's actually really good, and so that's gonna be what I like too. Um, Kathy says, I would be worried I get something I don't like. You know what, Kathy, it's true, but then again, if we listen to Anthony Bourdain's uh, end here, if you don't risk the bad meal, you'll never get the magical one, and that's how I've had some of the most magical ones. And and right, Phil says it's like eating omakase at a Japanese restaurant, for sure. Uh, you go to Japanese sushi restaurants, omakase is um, chef's choice. They just bring you some food. And I think also uh, eating at a lot of the high end, um, not just high end, even medium end, uh, Japanese um, hot spring hotels or traditional hotels, when you sit down for dinner, uh, you don't order. <laughs> you, you sit down for dinner at this restaurant, there's a price, and they bring you food. Like that's, and then they tell you what it is, but you don't get a choice of what you're gonna eat. They might give you a choice of like, okay, you can you can pick the small main course, whether you want beef or you want more fish or this and that, but like the 18 other courses are just things they pick, and I've gotten some really good foods that way. Um, Cottage Full of Love says, I love a good food experience, as I would imagine you would here on a stream talking about Anthony Bourdain and food. Um, Brandon says, it's like uh, the passenger taking the wheel in your car. It, it, I, I guess it could be that way. Like if you're not used to it, like saying, hey, why don't you, why don't you drive for me? Uh, and there is a bit of like relinquishing some control. Mm. But you know, I say that one of the things I love about eating at like a Chinese dim sum restaurants where they have like the carts that they bring the food around. I'm like, what I love about that is I never know what I'm gonna eat that day. You know, like I don't go in, like I've got some things I like in dim sum that I might be looking for in those carts, but instead the food just comes around and I'm gonna eat what comes around to be like, oh, that's interesting. What do you got over there? Like, well, give me one of those. Give me two of those. Give me three of those. Sure, let's give it a go. Um, I was recently, uh, when we were in Vancouver, um, <clears throat> we ate dim sum and uh, we were uh, with some of our family that's there in Vancouver. And I guess, cause I was the, you know, guest or something like that to Vancouver, they wanted me to order from the dim sum restaurant. And of course I wanted them to order from the dim sum restaurant. Cause I'm like, I've never eaten this place in my life. Like I've heard a lot of people say it's good. It's like the best dim sum restaurant in Vancouver. But I'm like, I don't know. What do you like? What is known here? What's fancy here? And of course then it's an order off the menu place. So I just order the things I, uh, I'm happy with. But then they were like, Oh, did you, Chris, did you order this? Did you order this? Did you order this? I'm like, no, but we should order those things. Cause I, I didn't know those were good. And when I looked at it through my lens, those weren't things that we have like at the dim sum restaurants here in Southern California. Matt says, you can never go wrong asking the host to take care of you at a restaurant. Great point, Matt, great point. Yeah, I, um, another note on this one, uh, there's a gelato restaurant in Laguna Beach that I really like um, called Gelato Paradiso. If you're in Southern California, you're Disneyland, going to the beach, Laguna Beach, your best choice. And there's a gelato place that has delicious gelato. But when I go in there, and they got like, you know, 40 flavors of gelato. And <clears throat> I do the same thing every time I go in there where like, they're like, hey, what do you want? And I'm like, hey, give me the medium. That's the one that has like four flavors, right? Yeah, put your four favorite flavors in there. What? What, 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 what flavors do you want? Your four favorite, your four favorite flavors, put those in there. And I had one girl who worked there and she was like, seriously? 
Seriously, you want me to put my four favorite flavors in there? I'm like, yeah, your four favorite flavor. She's like, I've never had anybody ask for that before. I'm like, great, it's your first time. Uh, you put them in there and she t don't tell me before, just put it in there and then tell me what they are afterwards. And I like, I found some new, every time I do this, I find some new flavors and I'm like, I like that one and I like that one. And you know what, maybe there's one of the four that I don't like, but hey, there's three others and they're pretty good too. And, and I know new flavors for next time I go that I would never get otherwise. All right, the 10th thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food, we've been talking a lot about sushi, this one's about sushi, and that is to avoid bargain sushi. Uh, Anthony Bourdain says, I can't imagine a better example of things to be wary of in the food department than bargain sushi. Cheap sushi is generally bad sushi. Uh, and this is another one where like, uh, I had a friend who, you know, he was sick one day, wasn't feeling good. And I'm like, what did you eat? And he's like, oh, I got the sushi from, you know, the AM PM convenience store at the gas station. And I'm like, <laughs> I always wondered who orders those things. And I'm like, now I know. Um, but yeah, any places that are advertising like really cheap sushi is just the place that I'm like, I am steering very far away from those places, which makes me a person where like if people casually say like hey chris do you want to go out and get some sushi like it depends <laughs> do you want to go get good sushi or do you mean the place that's like all you can eat sushi for twenty dollars if you mean that place i have no desire to go there um, but if you want to go to the place where we can get, you know, the sea urchin and the sweet shrimp and things like that and the, you know, fatty tuna, I am in for the actual good sushi. But I don't want to, I don't want to waste my stomach space, particularly like the prepackaged grocery store sushi where the rice is just cold and hard. It's just gross. I don't know. Anybody likes that stuff personally. You know what? There's some people that there's a lot of people do because a lot of people buy it, but in sushi, the rice is not designed to be cold. It's supposed to be warm, not hot, not cold, warm, a little warmer than room temperature. Amber agrees there's nothing worse than bargain sushi. Those garbage massive rolls, all you can stand for a dollar kind of trash. Yeah, I, uh, I, our Aaron says Costco sushi now, avoid those at all costs. I tried the Costco sushi because I was like, it's a Costco. Maybe it's good. I really like the poke from Costco. Costco makes really good um, Hawaiian style poke. Um, but yeah, their sushi is really not good. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then there was a comment uh, about Vancouver and dim sum saying Vancouver doesn't have the best dim sum. You have to go to Richmond. Wu Tang Life, for what it's worth, our dim sum was in Richmond. Kieran Seafood, Richmond location. I just. For most people, that's all of Vancouver. Most people, most people around the world have no idea that there's the city just south of Vancouver called Richmond. That's where the airport is. And to, to everybody else, that's all Vancouver. But yes, to the Vancouverites, just south of Vancouver in the city of Richmond, that's where all the best Asian food is. Um, all right. A point traveler says fatty tuna is my jam. Uh, and Valerian the Max says do people really buy sushi at gas stations? They do. Um, and Dining with Derek says, this is something you should be aware of is raw fish should not be cheap. It should, at least not if you're looking for good raw fish or raw fish that won't make you sick. The 11th thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain is to be wary of the muscles. Not, not, this, not this kind of muscle. Chris, have you been working out? No, not of this. Is there actually a muscle there? Anyway, not this kind of muscle. The seafood variety of muscles, the shellfish. Uh, Anthony Bourdain writes in Kitchen Confidential that more often than not, muscles are allowed to wallow in their own foul-smelling piss in the bottom of a reach-in. They're rarely picked through to ensure that each and every one is healthy before being quickly cooked in a pot and served. If you're going to order them, be sure to give them a good once over before eating. And mussels are definitely one where I've found that at restaurants that specialize in mussels, and there are many, um, particularly in Paris, they really like their mussels, I find. Uh, in restaurants that specialize in mussels, they can be quite tasty. Everywhere else you get those muscles, you're like, hmm, uh, I, don't, I don't know, this, ooh, this, this tastes pretty poor. And as I was writing this one, I mentioned this to um, OC Girl, you know, just going through my list of things. And I guess this one never like maybe crystallized in her head before, but she's like, you know, come to think of that one. She's like, when I order my, you know, Korean uh, spicy tofu, which is like 
Generally, they put like a whole bunch of self shellfish in it. She's like, I always ask them to not put mussels in it because often the mussels are just not good. Uh, and Amber says my bicep is upside down. Yeah, my bicep is upside down with the, the shirt right there. Uh, Janelle agrees with this one. I've gotten food poisoning once in my life from mussels. I am sorry to hear that. Janelle, hey, you didn't need to learn it from Anthony Bourdain. You learned it that way. But for everybody else, uh, um, you know, yeah, don't get your pee flavored mussels. Bill says, I've had some delicious mussels in San Francisco, as you would from a city that is by the sea. And San Francisco has a lot of great seafood specialty restaurants. The 12th thing I've learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is to be kind to your server. Anthony Bourdain wrote in Kitchen Confidential to look at your waiter's face. He knows if he likes you, Maybe he'll stop you from ordering a piece of fish he knows is going to hurt you. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think, like, we had a conversation about this to, you know, like, hey, trust the server. If they want to take care of you, let them take care of you. In that case, you do need to be nice of them and have a good relationship with them so that they want to take care of you. And frankly, they, they are people too, you know? So, uh, in America... A little bit of small talk goes a long way with your server to make sure they're helping you get the best things. Um, Danielle uh, says she loves mussels, back on the mussels conversation. And Valerian asks, uh, what's OC Girl's favorite place? OC Girl loves sushi. Um, so I would say sushi is one of her favorite things to eat, like on like anniversaries, birthdays. She's often on the lookout for some pretty good omokase sushi places. Um, OC Girl... Also, she loves to try new things, you know? So last weekend we tried, a, or two weekends ago, we tried a place that um, basically makes like Chinese pancakes. They're not, they're not Western pancakes, they're Chinese pancakes. Was it good? It was not good, um, but she really likes to try new places. And I appreciate that too, because I would say, you know, before I met OC Girl, I was a little bit more creature of habit. I'll just eat the things that I really like and circulate through those every day. And given some of my own devices when I'm just around the house or these sorts of things, I like I have my regular my regular stops. I I like my burgers in a burger, Shake Shack. I like tacos. I like burritos. I like pizza. Um, and on just a boring day when I'm around my house, I am circulating in some of those same places. But then we do make it a point when it's the weekends to like let's go try something new for you know lunch on Saturday, lunch on Sunday. What can we do that is something we haven't had? every other day. Um, YouTube test says, what's your favorite restaurants in the Bay Area? I'm just going to give you one since we're talking about OC Girl too. Our favorite dim sum restaurant in the USA is Koi Palace in Daly City, which is just south of uh, San Francisco International Airport. There's also a really good um, Singaporean restaurant that is near San Jose Airport. I can't remember the name, but if you went to Yelp and you typed in Singaporean food, San Jose, this place is going to come up with like thousands of reviews and it's pretty good. Uh, and I guess people said, who's OC Girl? OC Girl is, uh, is Chris's wife. That's who. Is it weird that I say that in the third person? Yes, OC Girl. And OC Girl is the woman behind the camera, not of the live stream because this one's on a tripod, but the woman behind the camera of nearly all the videos that you see out there. If I'm not, if I'm not holding it in my hand, then she's holding the camera and the one, you know, walking around the hotels for the hotel reviews. If you want to see her, watch some hotel reviews, look for her reflection in the mirror, uh, and you'll see her uh, in those as we come up on mirrors. Uh, Off the Tide says, I was lucky with my first sushi experience, Zuma Sushi in 1990. Charlie Sheen was three people down the bar from me. That's a pretty neat experience. Um, John says, uh, Anthony Bourdain was the primary reason I did so many of my stage traveling abroad and challenged myself to audition uh, at High End Michelin's. Very cool, John. Uh, and Norma apparently also likes Koi Palace. I'm glad uh, we have someone else on the live stream that loves Koi Palace. It's super delicious uh, Chinese food. And it's a place where, you know, to Anthony's point about look for places where people eat there day after day after day. There's um, an article in like Eater San Francisco about Koi Palace. And the article actually talks about that like a lot of the people uh, eat there every day. Like they cut, there's like, you know, some Cantonese people that are like, I'm at Koi Palace like 
every day for breakfast or at least multiple times per week. That's how good that place is. Uh, and uh, eBay Hunter says, uh, have you ever been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? I sure have. It's a really neat aquarium. Lots of sea otters. It's pretty cool. I'd recommend it if you're wondering to go there. Brandon says, can OC Girl come on one of the live streams in the future? She definitely prefers to be behind the camera instead of in front of the camera. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't expect it anytime soon. All right. The 13th thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is... He calls it the grandma rule, and he says, be nice when you are a guest. Uh, this is a little bit less about eating at a restaurant, but this is about eating at other people's homes when you're invited to their home and they offer to cook you a meal. Uh, Bourdain writes, he says, uh, I often talk about the grandma rule for travelers. You may not like grandma's Thanksgiving turkey. It may be overcooked and dry, and her stuffing salty and studded with rubbery pellets of givlets you find unpalatable in the extreme. You may not even like the turkey at all, but it is grandma's turkey, and you're at grandma's house. So shut the F up and eat it, and afterwards say, thank you, grandma, and why, yes, yes, of course, I would love seconds. Uh, and this is, if you're a guest, be polite, um, you know, and Enjoy the food. Enjoy the experience. Enjoy the company. Um, if you if you really know the people and you're a chef, and even Anthony's a chef, and he's like, I'm not going to tell them how to cook it. I'm just going to say, my grandma, thank you very much. It was delightful that you made this turkey. I really enjoy being here. Now, this is separate from the grandma rule, which is, I would say, and Anthony Bourdain didn't say this one. This is Chris saying this one, which is, if you're eating out at a restaurant and you paid money for that food, don't be afraid to send it back, particularly if you look at it and it's like, it's not what you ordered, it's the wrong dish. Um, and I know, I know there were some things recently that like, what that guy from Carpool Karaoke, his name escapes me, where like he sent the omelet back three times and was rude. I don't mean be rude about it, but I mean like, if it's not what you ordered or clearly something's wrong with it, then just let them know and do it in a polite way to be like, hey, I ordered this and I don't know, do you think this is that? And most restaurants generally want to make sure you actually get what you wanted or what's going to make you happy. Um, Dining with Derek says, yes, whoever made the food worked hard to prepare for sure. And so appreciate their effort, appreciate that they brought you in as a guest. And Derek also, <laughs> that guy was James Corden. Thank you. James Corden is indeed that guy who um, apparently was a jerk about his omelets. Um, and uh, John does so, does say, uh, if you're going to um, pay for a steak and you ask for me medium rare ple or mid rare, please know what mid rare is. I, I, mid rare. Mid John, is mid rare different than medium rare? Uh, I am curious. Um, Andrew says, uh, what's the number one restaurant I visit if I go to Hong Kong? Because uh, I like dim sum. Um, my favorite is Maxim's at City Hall um, for dim sum. That's my like go-to spot when I go to Hong Kong. There's also at the Four Seasons Hotel, and I don't remember the name of it, but there's like a Michelin two-star dim sum restaurant that's like super good. But like dim sum uh, is probably what you want to eat when you're in Hong Kong, Chris's, um, Chris's opinion. Okay. The 14th thing to know uh, from Anthony Bourdain about food is that butter makes everything better. Uh, on the Oprah Winfrey show, Bourdain as a guest said, butter is usually the first thing and the last thing in just about every pan. That's why restaurant food tastes better than home food a lot of the time. Butter. Uh, that's why Ruth's Chris serves their steaks in butter. So don't kick yourself if your home cooked food doesn't taste like the restaurant. You probably didn't use enough butter. Um, and, and I like, this is one where, you know, if you go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, they don't just like cook it in butter. It comes to your table on a plate with butter, 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 butter everywhere. And you know, I don't know if you're, if you're a cook, I'm not really a cook all that much, but when I cook food at home and I follow the recipe, you know, and the recipe is like, how many sticks of butter am I supposed to put in this thing? Uh, but yes, butter does make everything better. And one of the things I've realized too, is there are a lot of different types of butter. And a lot of the American butter 
really doesn't taste like much of anything. You know, I, growing up in America, never really understood why people eat toast with butter on it. I'm like, this is toast with butter. Boy, that sounds really kind of boring. Or English muffins with butter on it. And I'm like, eh, these are just, they're not very tasty. And then uh, I went to London. I went to England and I had butter in England, I had good butter in England on an English muffin there. And I was like, oh, I, I understand now. This is actually, this butter actually tastes really like rich and creamy. Um, so if you're making it at home and it doesn't taste right and you add a lot of butter, then maybe look for some better butter. Uh, John says French or Canadian butter is the bomb, y'all. Uh, Mrs. Clay says Irish butter is awesome. And Amber says, yes, good mashed potatoes. You got to put a lot of butter in those mashed potatoes. I agree. Mashed potatoes. I like, uh, I like the red potatoes. I like to mash the red potatoes, add in butter and, you know, you can put in milk, but you could also put in like heavy whipping cream, which is pretty good too. Makes it even more uh, rich. Priyanko asks, um, what my favorite restaurant in Sydney was? Uh, my favorite restaurant in Sydney was Mamak, which is a Malaysian restaurant in Sydney's Chinatown. Uh, they've got one in Melbourne. I just love it there. I love their food so much, I brought back a couple of their um, chili sambals as well. They make this really good roti, which is uh, like a um, Malaysian flatbread. They make fresh and it's like Mamak in Sydney, like you know it's a popular restaurant when they open at five and at 4.50 when I went by, there are about 20 people in line in front of the restaurant while it's dark waiting for it to open at five. All right, and that was one of our tips from Anthony Bourdain, right? Look for the line and where the locals go and where the locals eat regularly. 15th thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is to skip the airplane food. Hey, we're here at Travel Channel, a lot of us go on airplanes, and he says, uh, no one has ever felt better after eating airplane food. I think people only eat it because they're bored. I don't eat on planes. I like to arrive hungry. Anthony goes on to say, the food can't possibly be that good on an airplane. It can be edible at best, no matter how hard they try. The conditions they're working in, there's not much they can do. Um, and uh, the food in the airport, while mediocre, is almost always better than the plain food. Um, so, you know, this is one where like, when I travel, hey, if we're going to the airport, is there some place we can stop before we go to the airport? Uh, is there like a lounge at the airport we can go to? Yeah, can we fuel up before we get on the plane? Can we get something from one of the airport restaurants and bring it on the plane? And then sort of like a last resort is eating on the plane. Obviously, if you're on a 12 hour international flight, you need to eat on the plane. Uh, but I'm also the one where like, whatever the breakfast they serve me on the plane is, I'm like, eh, and I like get to the destination. I'm like, can I have, can I have a second breakfast? <laughs> like, I need a second breakfast to like do something with whatever that breakfast was they serve me on the plane. Uh, Point Thriller says, tell that to Emirates, Anthony. Emirates is definitely known for good food. Uh, Singapore Airlines is known for good food. Japan Airlines in business class has good food. But I would say that's all good food as far as airplane food goes. And I don't think it's better than food you'd have not on the airplane. Uh, Valerian says, I eat uh, before I get to the airport. Uh, and then John says, it's also heavily seasoned because of the dulled palates when you're at that um, elevation, which makes a lot of sense. The 16th thing I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is that the In-N-Out Burger at LAX Airport in Los Angeles is the best restaurant in Los Angeles. That's right, Anthony Bourdain said it. We had some people talking about In-N-Out Burger earlier on. And this is in a YouTube video that was posted by Eater LA where they interviewed Anthony Bourdain eating at the In-N-Out Burger at LAX. By the way, I say at LAX, it's actually not in the airport, it's right next to the airport. It's like right next to the runway, at the foot of the runway. It is legendary in Los Angeles. It's legendary among um, aviation enthusiasts because when you're sitting there eating the like, um, you know, A380s come what seems like about 50 feet over your head as they're coming to land. It's a really neat spot. Um, but what Anthony says about that In-N-Out Burger is he says that 
in particular on his way uh, in and out of Los Angeles, he always stopped by the LAX In-N-Out Burger. And sometimes he would get In-N-Out Burger when he arrives in Los Angeles and he would take it to go and he would eat it in his hotel lobby. Now, Anthony goes on to say that that experience of bringing In-N-Out Burger to a hotel lobby is so much different than typical fast food. If you bring typical fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, to a hotel lobby, the hotel staff will sneer at you and be like, Sir, we have a restaurant. But In-N-Out Burger is celebrated. They say, Sir, Good choice, and I wish I was eating that right now. Uh, Anthony Bourdain also goes on to say that the hamburger is a perfectly designed protein delivery system. And, like, this is really true. And, you know, particularly, like, in California, in places that have In-N-Out Burger, it definitely has this, like, legendary status. And I think the staff at the hotel, they look at that food and go, like, good choice, sir. Well done. I applaud you for getting that and bringing it here. Uh, Carmen says, I love that in and out, but that is an exaggeration. Um, you love it? Tell, tell me more, Carmen, if it's an exaggeration, which part are you exaggerating? Uh, I will say that in and out Burger is really quite busy. I ate there recently uh, when I was coming back from Orlando at like 10.30 at night, and the place was like packed. I mean, it's like 10.30 p.m. at night. How is this place completely full of people eating burgers? Um, Valerian asked if I go on boat cruises. Uh, you know what? We're not a huge fan of cruises. OC Girl gets seasick, so we've not been uh, big cruise monsters. Uh, Kathy says um, that uh, we didn't try that in and out location, but we didn't like their fries. Fries and in our burger definitely acquired taste. I would say in particular in this video, Anthony was just eating the burger and didn't have any fries in his tray, so he was entirely talking about the burgers. Brandon says, uh, it must be a legendary place to eat at. Uh, Cottage Full of Love says, I'm going to be passing LAX in a couple weeks. Now I'm wondering if I need to stop. If you are an aviation geek at all, College Full of Love, then yes, you need to stop at the uh, In-N-Out Burger at LAX. Danielle says, I agree with Anthony Bourdain. LAX In-N-Out is so good. I'm biased because I live 10 minutes, uh, and I've eaten there many, many times. Very cool, Danielle. Uh, also in that area, I really like Ayara for Thai food by LAX. And then there's a place, I'm not going to remember the name, but it's like in, um, what, West, West Chester, uh, just like down the road from LAX where they have really good like chicken tacos, chicken burritos, like rotisserie chicken burritos that I really love as well uh, after I come into LAX or if I'm departing of there. Uh, and the 17th thing that I learned from Anthony Bourdain about food is that really a significant part of travel, this isn't a quote, this is just in general, I learned that a significant part of uh, travel and a place and a culture is their food. You know, watching Anthony Bourdain visit these places, a big part of his experience visiting the place was eating the food, how he eats the food, where he eats the food, the way the food is eaten. And so I think if you don't experience the local cuisines in the local restaurants, then you're not getting the complete experience of what it's really like to be in that place. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers, those are the 17 things I've learned from Anthony Bourdain about food. Hopefully, I've uh, shared a few new things with you as well or just um, tightened up some things, some suspicions you have already had about definitely don't eat the mussels because they've been sitting in their own piss all day. All right, uh, so what questions do you have? If you asked a question before and I didn't answer it, ask it again, put a question mark uh, at the end of it to make sure I know a question. And then uh, after a little bit of Q&A, I will be giving away a t-shirt as I do every live stream today. It's going to be a spunky princess t-shirt. Uh, so you can look forward to that coming up here in just a few minutes. Jeff Boyardee says, have you ever been to the company store at Baldwin Park? I sure have. I've been there a number of times. Also, every time I go to Vegas, I stop in the company store in Vegas. So much so that the people who work in the company store in Vegas know me. Like I walk in, they're like, hey, welcome back. It's good to see you. I have a lot of In-N-Out Burger stuff. I'm trying to Look, if I have one in hand's reach, I probably don't. But over here, just out of reach, I have a In-N-Out Burger snow globe that, like, you can turn it and it does, like, the In-N-Out Burger uh, theme song. It's what a hamburger's all about. Yeah, pretty cool. 
Uh, Emmett says, uh, I missed the stream. Just want to say I love Yellow Productions. Emmett, thank you very much. And uh, Yellow Productions love you too. Uh, I.R. Aaron says, would you ever come visit Calgary, Alberta, Canada? Yes, I would. Uh, no Filter says, what's your fondest Anthony Bourdain memory? My fondest Anthony Bourdain memory uh, was he was doing a... Uh, one of his travel shows where he was in like Cambodia or someplace like that and he's riding this train and the train doesn't have air conditioning, it has open windows, it has um, red curtains on it, the red curtains are blowing into the train. Anthony in this scene said uh, that this train, they had to stop like three or four times because wheels were broken on the train to replace the wheels and he had said the train had a complete and total lack of any suspension and he described the train ride as a kidney softening train ride. That is my number one memory of Anthony Bourdain. Um, Amber says, uh, is in a burger really worth the hype? I never eat burgers. Uh, yes, it is worth the hype, I, I think. Uh, Dining with Derek says, what's your favorite food in Japan? Ooh, I have a lot of favorite foods in Japan. Um, but I think if if I if I had to pick one favorite food in Japan, it would be gyoza. It would be Japanese pot stickers. Essentially, I love gyoza, and so I love to try all the different types of gyoza in Japan. Janelle says, what's your favorite Vegas restaurant? I really love Earl of Sandwich. That sounds pretty boring, but Earl of Sandwich is something that I eat every time I go to Vegas. I also really like the pastrami at the New York, New York Hotel. I like a lot of fast food stuff, so I don't sit down for a long time. Uh, this time, going to Vegas for our, um, you know, hey, what's new in 2023 update. Uh, we're looking forward to eating. We're gonna eat at Mott 32. We're gonna have the Peking Duck. We're gonna eat at Caesars Palace at the uh, Bacchanal Buffet. So those are the two we picked out so far. But I really, I really try to pick a lot of new things in Vegas. That way I can also make new videos and, and talk about them instead of circulating through some old favorites. Oh, Mrs. Clay says, I'm eating at Lotus of Siam in Vegas. What should I order? Lotus of Siam is one of my favorite restaurants in Vegas. Uh, and it's been a while, but uh, Miss Clay, if they have cow soy in the menu still, and I think they do, they did when I was there last time, it's a northern curry dish with noodles. I really like the cow soy. It's certainly the mango sticky rice. You can't go wrong with pad thai at a Thai restaurant. Uh, so those are some of my standby favorites. Cal says, what is Spunky Princess's favorite food? She has a lot of foods that she likes, but I think her, uh, if she had a favorite food, it would be seaweed rice um, with basso. What is basso? It's like a um, preserved pork, dried pork that's kind of shredded a little bit. It's a Taiwanese specialty. We say seaweed rice. It's like steamed rice that then we get Korean roasted seaweed and we roll the rice up in the Korean roasted seaweed, sprinkle the um, pork, kind of the dried pork on it, and then sprinkle some furikake uh, seasoning, like a Japanese seasoning on it, and that's her favorite thing to eat. It's really like a, you know, multicultural Asian fusion thing. It's got the Korean roasted seaweed, it's got the Japanese furikake, and it's got the um, Taiwanese dried pork. Spunky Princess also really loves In-N-Out Burger. That's in her weekly rotation, as is cheese pizza. Mm. Gina says, uh, favorite place in Vancouver? I guess this isn't, uh, I guess for a food place, it's definitely Chuen Judah, the Peking duck place. Um, but like as an attraction, my favorite attraction in Vancouver is the Capilano Suspension Bridge Park. JG says, White Castle's overrated. I think White Castle Burger is gross, personally. Um, J Dev says, are you ever going to put a space between the A and Q and A? I see it all the time, but never said anything. Uh, no, probably not. I don't know. I'll have to go look and where I did that. Maybe it's in that like video animation thing. I don't know. It's probably too much work to redo that. So I'll probably leave it just like it is. Uh, M says, uh, I love gyoza too. I'm Japanese. Awesome. I'm glad we both have a love for gyoza. Uh, Let's see, Wu Tai says, after listening to this, I miss Anthony Bourdain. He was a legend. He was a legend. Cottage Full of Love says, would you ever come to NorCal like Sacramento through Gold Rush Country up to Tahoe, do videos, it's beautiful in the fall. Sounds good, should be on my list. Um, I've done uh, at least one video of Tahoe about driving in the snow in Lake Tahoe, which does well seasonally uh, every winter when people are like, do I need snow chains or things like that? Uh, but I will consider that. <clears throat> Chris uh, says, related to the Lotus of Siam, get anything from the northern section 
which is what they're known for. All right, that's a great pro tip. Uh, Wu Tai says, I need to write a book one day. All right, I'll keep that in mind because he says I'll be the new Anthony. You are too kind, Wu Tai. I appreciate that. Uh, Nick says, hey, Chris, when did the Traveling Princess become the Spunky Princess? Uh, a month ago when I started her new channel. Um, Spunky Princess for the real quick backstory because I said it in the last live stream so I don't want to repeat myself every single time, but there's another princess that is a fact princess that is the Traveling Princess, so that name was taken. So when I started up her channel, I wanted it to be um, something that wasn't taken already, that nobody else used and that nobody else was trademarked. And so she is the Spunky Princess. YouTube just rolled out handles, so she has at Spunky Princess. So there you go. That's when she became the Spunky Princess. So if you haven't been over to her channel yet, just type in Spunky Princess into the YouTube search and you can see a lot of her adventures. Uh, Michael says, any plans to visit Banff and Lake Louise in Canada? I hope that those are our next destinations in Canada because um, I've heard the Fairmonts at both those places are super amazing. And so I would like to uh, stay at both those Fairmonts. I'm a traveler that's definitely like, I go where there are good hotels. I don't, I don't go where there are sucky hotels. Uh, Jake says, you should take the Coast Starlight train up to Portland, Seattle. Beautiful ocean reviews and do a review. Your family would love that trip. I will keep that in mind, Jake. Thank you. I, I've heard it's scenic. Uh, sounds like fun. I just, you know, Amtrak, it's never on time. So um, I, I, wish, I wish it would be. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers, uh, if you want to win the Spunky Princess t-shirt, you need to answer my question here correctly, uh, and I'll ship it anywhere in the world in size, uh, whatever size you would like. Uh, and so my question for you is, Anthony Bourdain's book uh, that we talked about was, uh, was called Kitchen Confidential, but what was the title of his New Yorker article that he wrote in 1999 before publishing that Kitchen Confidential book? First person who names that article correctly uh, will win a Spunky Princess shirt. Now, while you're typing in those things, if you say, Chris, I want to get a shirt, can I buy one? Are you selling the Spunky Princess shirts yet? Because I've got, I've got some kiddos or other people that would love them. You can pick up a Spunky Princess shirt over at the Yellow Production shop at shop.yellow-productions.com. And if you wonder, Chris, when is the next live stream? Probably going to be next week. I'm thinking back on Tuesday. But if you really want to know, sign up for the Yellow Productions update, my email list, where I email you and let you know when the live streams are going to be, what they're going to be about, and you will know those always a couple days ahead of time. And now we have a winner, winner chicken dinner. All right. Congratulations goes to... Nick Bubble Tea, don't eat before reading this. That's the correct answer. Nick, send me an email to chris at yellow-productions.com. You'll find a link to that in the description below. Let me know your address, what size shirt you want, and I will get it right over to you. Uh, second place, coming in one second later, is from Grant. You were correct as well. Um, and uh, then third place goes to Jake. But uh, Nick, congratulations, you win the shirt. Well, fellow explorers, it's always a pleasure hanging out with y'all. Uh, as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'm going to see you in the next video.